Well, good morning and almost happy new year. <laughs> almost, not quite. We're going to be going back to what we've been studying now for months, excluding the month of December so far. And that is, what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse? If you remember, we are comparing this to the individual who goes to the gym constantly, who's constantly working out, who's lean, mean, buff, and tough. Well, you didn't get that way overnight, or that individual did not get into shape like that overnight. We're getting into that part of the year where everyone's about to make their New Year's resolution, and what's one thing on that list? To get in shape, to exercise more. Well, if only we would exercise spiritually more in this new year, that we might become more of a Pentecostal power. We look at the person who constantly is working out, who's buff, tough, and lean to me. But as Christians, we need to do that spiritually. We need to get in shape spiritually. We need to become and aim to strive to become Pentecostal powerhouses. It does not happen overnight, just like the person who lifts weights. It does not happen overnight. You don't just wake up one day and all of a sudden you have muscles, muscles, and muscles galore. Same way is true in the spirit. You can't expect to be filled with baptism of the Holy Ghost and work, work, working perfectly in the gifts of the spirit all overnight. It comes in time. But as we strive to become a Pentecostal powerhouse, the first issue we dealt with was that of faith. We know that every man is given a measure of faith. When we look at the atheist, even he has faith. It's faith that nothing ever happened, but he still has faith in his religion. If you ever watch Lee Strobel as a case for Christ, <coughs> he goes through his life where he's trying to figure out whether or not the Bible is true, whether or not it's false. Because his wife just got saved and he wants to prove that it's false. But at the end of his study, what he made a list of all the pros to believe in Christianity and all the cons against it. And what he found was it took more faith to believe in the fact that Jesus did not rise, in, rise from the dead and believe in Christianity than it did to actually believe in Christianity in the first place. And we are going to be talking about the same topic today. But just as a refresher, what is the enemy of faith? Doubt. Doubt. Doubt is the enemy of faith. We used and we looked at that example in the New Testament. Jesus kind of just came out of the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights were fasting. And we find the disciples trying to cast out a demon. And every time we preach and we talk about spiritual warfare, we talk about how... This kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting. Jesus rebuked the disciples. This kind comes not out but by, by prayer and fasting. But before he told them that piece of instruction, do you remember what he told them? Why the demon didn't come out? It's because you doubted. It's because of your unbelief. So before Jesus even gave them the instruction, why it didn't come out, he said, the big problem wasn't the fact, just the prayer and fasting, but the big fact was you doubted. Doubt is the enemy of faith. And we've talked about faith, and we've talked about uh, other aspects. We've talked about prayer and the need for it, and fasting, and reading your Bible. But then we started moving on to the armor. How much of the armor does God instruct us to put on? The whole armor of God. We get that from the book of Ephesians. We'll have to back up because I don't think it is Ephesians. It is Ephesians. If someone would please read Ephesians 6, 11, and 12 just as a refresher as we're going into this. And someone else finds 2 Corinthians 10.4. 2 Corinthians 10.4. So how much of the armor are we supposed to put on? We are supposed to put on the whole armor. Why are we supposed to put on the whole armor? 
slowing. If you remember back, we did that little chart up to show and illustrate not how many demons are at the per se, but to give us an idea on why we need to build the whole armor of God. And while we might have one-on-one uh, -on -one combats with the enemy, sometimes they're attacking us from all sides. And just only having one piece of the armor is not going to protect us from being surrounded and being attacked on all sides. And what does 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 state? So the weapons of our car warfare, they're carnal, they're physical, right? They're fleshly. No, they're more spiritual. We are talking, I know Brother Eli is just, but regardless, when we look at our weapons, they're not carnal, they're not fleshly. They're mighty to God. And while we're looking at the armor, Paul starts describing physical armor. He starts describing the breastplate of righteousness. He started talking about, and we'll talk about later, the helmet of salvation. We've talked about the belt of truth. While Paul described them in a physical nature, he did that just like a pastor would use an illustration in a sermon. It sheds light on it. It gives us greater understanding. And that's not our common in teaching because even Jesus did that. He did what we call parables. Heavenly stories, uh, earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Why? Because he was trying to give insight to the disciples and those listening about spiritual things and bring it down to their level, something that they could understand, something that they could grasp and wrap their minds around. Paul's doing the exact same thing with the armor of God. He's relating it to stuff that the Corinthians and the Ephesians have seen every single day. I mean, they were under Roman occupation. They knew what the Roman breastplate was. They knew what the Roman shield looked like. They knew what the Roman sandals looked like. They knew that the belt held it all together. These are things that they could all relate to and understand. So Paul's using the same concept. And even though we started off talking with on the topic of faith, today we're going to continue it. We're going to be looking at the shield of faith. What does Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16 state? And someone else find Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Hebrews 11, 6, and Ephesians 6, 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Notice it does not say some of the fiery darts or only a few of the fiery darts. It says all of them. What does Hebrews chapter 11, verse 60? For without faith, faith it is impossible to please him. For he is that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith, it is impossible to please God. We are talking about the shield of faith today. I remember growing up, we had metal trash cans. And it's that time of the year where those lids got used for something else besides just keeping the snow off the trash can. Because when you're in a snowball fight with your siblings, it's not just enough to be out there and throw in a snowball. You want something to stop their snowballs. So me and my brother used to take the trash can uh, lids and use them as a shield against each other's snowballs. Mama didn't raise a fool. Well, when it comes to the spiritual, we have shield. It's not composed of metal, and it's not to stop snowballs, but rather it's composed of faith. And what's the purpose of it? To stop all the fiery darts of the enemy. The Roman soldier, when he would carry, when he would go to war, he would normally carry a shield with him in the battle. And when we look at the shield, it played a crucial role. Depending, and there were all different kinds of shapes and sizes of shields. 
but they played an important role. They were mainly used as an offensive weapon against the enemy. If they had one of those larger shields, or even maybe one of the smaller ones, they could actually put a stand on there, have the shield on here, and it would block the enemy from attacking and try to prevent them from forcing their way through. If you ever saw the big Roman shields that were almost up to their necks, they actually had a spike in the bottom, and they would set it in the ground, and they would line up and hold it so people couldn't penetrate. A shield was an offensive weapon, but it could also be used in a de uh, it was a defensive weapon, but it could also be used in an offensive man manner if needed. When we look at us as soldiers in the army of the Lord, he's given us shields to fight this battle against the enemy. And as I've already said, and as we've already read, our shields aren't composed of earthly material, but rather it is composed of faith. And the shield is composed of our faith, not just anybody's faith, but our faith. Yes, when we become a Christian, our faith becomes, uh, Christ's faith becomes our faith, but we are still given a measure of faith, and it's our responsibility to allow it to grow. I don't have it in my notes, but we've, I'm sure we've studied it when we looked at the past. <coughs> Remember that illustration of the mustard seed that God gave us with faith? Now he said the birds come and pluck it out. But that faith can grow into such a great tree that the birds can land the rest of it and find rest. We can either take that mustard seed, that seed of faith, and allow it in the soil, and we can stun its growth. And we can allow it not to grow at all. Or we can allow God to water it, and the Holy Ghost water it, and we can allow that seed of faith to grow. But that seed, the growth of that seed can be stunted at any point depending upon us. Whether or not we allow the faith to grow or not. But as we continue pushing forward, what is faith? If we were to find, look for a biblical definition of faith, where would we find that? Or what would it be to know by heart? Faith means believing in something you don't see. Yep. And mom hit the verse on the head. Hebrews 11, verse 1. You want to go ahead and read that? Faith is the substance or the composition of things hoped for. It is made up of things hoped for, even though they're not seen. And then we go into this great long chapter. We know that Abraham looked for a city to fill their maker with God. He may not have seen it on this earth, but it's currently being prepared for us in heaven. Faith exists as the glue that holds us together. It is that even though one may never see it with their eyes, they know without a shadow of doubt that it is true. Just, yes. What was that verse your mother read? Hebrews 11, 11. and verse 1. Okay. Hebrews 11 and right, 1. Thank you. Yep. So it's something that happens as a result of our eye. Uh, something that we know is now a shadow of doubt, even if we can't see it. Even today, we are exercising faith. If you think within yourself, and I'm not going to look for a show of hands or anything, but if you confess your sins, ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and stop sinning, that makes you what? It makes you saved. It makes you a Christian. Do you always feel that you're saved? As you're going down the road, as you're coming into church, did you just have that same feeling, yep, I'm saved today? No. No. You don't always feel that God's away from you a lot of time. But you, you know, can have an assurance that you're saved. And then sometimes it feels like you're right on your shoulder watching you. <laughs> yep. But I, just because I, you... That's how I got ready. I was doing laundry already. It felt like I was studying pretty much. And Felt like he was on my right behind me looking. I turned around and looked and said, hey. And you know he was, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know he's not going to be there physically. Yep. So we can know that we're saved without feeling that we're saved. Oh, but 
for whatsoever is not as faith is said. Exactly. So he does, his faith, doubt, once again, we see that doubt is the enemy of faith. It goes against it. It works against it. But what I'm getting at here is you don't always feel faith, but you know it. You can know without a shadow of doubt that you're saved. Even though you don't, there's no safe feeling. Yes, you might feel good at some times, but, and you can feel God, but it doesn't mean that you know, you just know that you're saved. And if you have sin in your life and the, the Holy Ghost is dealing with you, well then you know there's something you need to get right. But it's not something that you always feel. Because we, our Christian experience is not based upon feeling. So faith is knowing without a shadow of doubt that we're saved, without having that feeling. Right now, we do not feel that, may not feel that Christ has come back at any moment, but the Word of God says that He is. Because we know that the Word of God is true, we can know without a shadow of doubt that He's coming. Is that a feeling? <coughs> that is faith, because we know that He is. It's knowing that something's happening, even though we're not even seeing it. Right now, there is a war going on for our soul. We may not feel it, but it's happening. So faith is knowing that something is real, even though we do not feel it physically. And when we look at faith, faith is the first step in receiving salvation. Knowing that God has pardoned us of our sins, and that knowing that they are forgiven without any physical piece of evidence. Maybe when we get saved, we feel like a weight is lifted off our shoulders, but there's not a feeling that goes with us. 100% uh, of the time. We go forward in faith. And when we, if we would base everything with feelings, are our feelings always the same? No. Sometimes we doubt things. Sometimes we feel different things. And that may not be the situation at all. Even growing up, have you ever heard a kid or say something? Well, I don't think that person likes me. And that might not be the case at all. That person might actually like them, but it's a feeling. Our feelings can lead us astray. So faith is not based upon feeling. It is based upon the Word of God, what we know is true. And our faith is dependent upon us to whether or not we allow it to grow. That is faith. <coughs> And when we look at faith, it is the fundamental component to the believer's armor because without it, the believer has already lost the battle and possibly the war. When people go into a game, if you go to a football game, maybe they have a pep rally or a cheer before the game, or even when it comes to professional football, how many people say, yeah, well, we were on their home field. They, they had home field advantage. They had all their people cheering them on. But wait till we get to our home stadium. That is a whole different ball game because they're on our turf. They're on our property. Why does that make a difference? They got more confidence. They, they have more confidence. They feel more confidence and they feel it's more confidence is what, I, is what it is. But in a way, I always look at it when I play that if you're good, you, you play no matter what, and you play the best you can no matter where you're playing. But how I would look at it, but you're right, people do believe because they get bonfired before big games and they have like they might be cheers and stuff like that. But, but what would happen, even if one went field advantage, if they didn't have themselves all pumped up and they went into feeling, oh we lost this one already. They've already lost. They've already lost up here, so they've already lost out there. The same is true in Christianity. If we doubt, if we, go, if we go by our feelings sometimes, we're deceived. We can know the Bible inside and out. What does it say about uh, us versus the world? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. What does it say about the Christian? The angels of the Lord encamp themselves around them that fear him. When we look at us as Christians, God's given us, us the armor. He's given us the word of God. What does the Bible say about the word of God? It is quick, it is powerful. To the divine of bone and marrow. But if we forget all those things and we allow the enemy to creep in our head and place that big D word in our mind, doubt, and we've already feel that we lost, 
regardless of what the Word of God says, we've already lost. And our faith, while it might have been great, is now down to a little. What, what makes you think this when you're praying for an alcoholic? Like my wife's an alcoholic. And I've been praying for her, praying for her, and it seems like she's getting worse. Why does that Why does that happen? Well, we get we I need to keep why, praying. Why when you're praying for somebody you're thinking they get better and then it seems like she's getting better and then it seems again she drinks more. And I'm pretty frustrated about it, but uh, it's it's weird. But that's why we just got to keep persevering in prayer. I mean, it is dependent upon her own free will. But the Holy Ghost can deal with them. You were going to say something, brother? That's why you never give up. That's why you never give up. Um, I love Churchill's <coughs> speech during World War II. It was given right after, if I'm not mistaken, the Battle of Dunkirk, where all the Englishmen were gathered on the beach. And basically, they were there for their doom. If they never got shipped in to get them out, the Germans just kept bombing, bombing the beach, and they were losing. And Churchill was going in speech, uh, ships to get him out. But he gave a speech that said, never surrender. We will fight them on the sea. We will fight them on the land. Regardless of what their situation was, because their situation was grim. It was grim. If they didn't get their men off the beach, they pretty much lost the war. Their entire army was stranded there. The same is true with us as Christians. If we do not have that mentality of never give up, never surrender, then we're going to allow doubt to creep in, and then our faith is going to have to and we're not going to win the war. And we may not win that battle. Because guess what? The more you doubt, the smaller your shield gets. See, the armor of God is different than any other armor known to man. I love the comparison that the Holy Ghost gave me years ago, was that of David's armor given to him by Saul versus God's armor. When we go back to David, and the armor that Saul gave him. Do you remember his complaints and everything else? It was big. It was clumsy. Paul, Saul was head and shoulders above all the other, other Israelites. If you read back through the word of God, when he was crowned king, he was hiding the stuff, but yet he was found out because he was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was taller. David was not that tall from what we studied, which meant Saul's armor would have been big. It would have been clumsy. It would have been heavy. It wasn't meant and designed for David. See, a soldier's armor is supposed to fit perfectly, snug. That way they can fight, they can move. But Saul's armor was not that way. But when it comes to God's armor, it is that way for us. God's armor is a living armor. It is alive. And it grows with us. As we grow in God, the armor of God grows with us. Which means our shield of faith, if we have great faith, could be a massive shield protecting us. But the more we doubt, that shield gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And what happens when a soldier's shield gets smaller? Well, then the area which they can get hit from widens. And if your shield gets down to this small, guess what? You have this big old area for the enemy to hit with his fiery darts. Now, our shield is supposed to protect us from all the fiery darts of the wicked, but that is dependent upon our faith. It is dependent upon you. It is dependent upon me. If we doubt, that shield will shrink, and it will not be as effective as it is supposed to be. And then the enemy has many darts to attack us with. That, darts of depression. Doubt, uh, darts of doubt. Darts of suicidal thoughts. He is, the enemy does not play fair. He really does not. Well, I, I believe there's two there. There's religion, and then there's also when you have a relationship with God. When you're studying the brain all the time, and you've got a relationship with God, I believe he protects you. He might, you know, yes. Religion is like years ago, I believe in religion. I went to church and then I was out in the bar room and the house drinks. You know, I don't do no good. You know what I mean? And there are a lot of religions in this world. Religion to me is nothing but an act. It's just an action. It's not a relationship with God. Religion will not save you. It is not putting you on the right path. Christianity is a relationship with God. And as we grow in God, our weapons grow with them. Yes. He does put his angels around us, but today we're talking about faith and that shield and how it's to protect us and how we are in a battle. 
and the enemy is going to attack us from all sides. But if we doubt those fiery darts that were meant to be stopped by the shield, they're going to pen uh, penetrate us and get through, and they're going to be in affecting us. That is why it's imperative that we keep ourselves well, you grounded. Mean dark. You mean by making you think? You're letting the devil get uh, false thoughts into your head. Yes. Is that what you mean by that? It, it could be a number of things. It could be false thoughts. Because one thing the enemy loves to do is he likes to disguise his voice and make it sound like our own. That's one way he tries to get through. It could be the devil working with, I should say, not when I say working through, I don't mean demon possession, but he is using somebody else to get to you. Maybe there's somebody in the church that's coming against you. I know at work, there literally was somebody that was physically trying to get me fired for no reason. It could be absolutely anything. It could be vehicular issues. It could be financial issues that just seem like they're piling one thing after another after another. It could be a combination of things. It could be finances mixed with health problems and everything. Because everything just adds up. And he can use all those things to make this doubt, well, where's God in the middle of this? Am I going to get through it? Um, God's forsaken me. To get you discouraged. And what happens when you get discouraged? You doubt. And when you doubt, your faith dwindles. Because doubt is the enemy of faith. That's why we need to get grounded in the Word of God. That's why we need to memorize the Word of God. That's why we need to meditate on the Word of God. And make sure that our eyes were always fixated on Christ. What happened to Peter when his eyes got focused on the situation? He began sinking. But the whole time before that, he was, his situation did not change. He was still in the middle of the storm. The wave pattern still did not change. The wind pattern still did not change. The wind, the rain, none of that changed. The only thing that changed in that situation was the location of Peter's eyes. He got his eyes off of Christ and on a situation. And when he got his eyes on a situation instead of Christ, what happened? He doubted. Because he doubted, he began sinking. But when Jesus told him, step out of the boat and come unto me, he had faith. Faith that he could, whatever the situation was, whether he realized he was walking on the water, or whether it seemed like everything vanished away, I don't know what it was like in Peter's mind at that time. Sometimes we can get so wrapped up in the glory and presence of God, everything vanishes. It doesn't matter what's around us, we just see Jesus. That's all we see, and we press forward. Sometimes we see the situation and we see Jesus, we know that he tells us to do something, and we do it anyhow. And as long as we're doing and have faith that he's going to see us through, we have faith. But the moment that we doubt, faith dwindles. Faith in God and his gifts to men defeats the enemy. If the believer knows the truth, then his or faith increases and cannot be broken. And I'm wrapping up. One of the most dangerous thing, <coughs> things to any government or any other religion that's come against us, or even the Muslims. If we would get, somebody would come in here that was Muslim that said either, oh, you go this way or you die. Or if the government came in and said, you got to believe this way or you're going to die. Or we're going to persecute you. It doesn't matter how much they persecute you. The most dangerous thing about an individual is what they know. That's the most dangerous thing. That's weird you brought that up. I have a friend that comes from Jerusalem. And he called me last week and asked me to go to their uh, mosque. And I talked to Dennis about it. Dennis said, I won't go. No. So I, I would beat myself up on that. I'd like to see what they're really, how they worship in that. But to me, Muslims are going to hell. Because they believe the way he believes, the way he told me, God is God, but Jesus is Anyone who does not believe in the word of God. God. Yep. You know, but I keep myself.